What's up guys, it's River, and today we're looking at the Fuji X-T3, a criminally overlooked camera in the APS-C market right now. This camera outperforms Sony and Canon cameras that are in the same price range. So let's do a deep dive, figure out exactly what makes this camera so special, why it's so overlooked, and why it just might be the perfect camera for you. Let's get into it. Also, just to let you guys know, there's a link down below for the best deal on this camera, so be sure to check that out. I think the biggest reason this camera's so overlooked is because on the surface level, the specs seem the same as most Sony and Canon cameras, but you have to look below the surface and see the quality and the efficiency that this camera provides. It's kind of like cars. All cars have four wheels, but to say that a Conda is the same as a Ferrari, just because it has four wheels, is obviously not right. So let's look at photos. On the surface level, this camera seems to have pretty like mediocre specs. It does about what Canon and Sony and Nikon do. It does 11 frames per second, raw, uncompressed, or compressed, JPEG, all that good stuff. And you wouldn't really take a second look at this camera. But what makes this camera really special photos wise is the fact that it does 11 frames per second or 20 frames per second in electronic shutter or 30 frames per second electronic shutter, which is actually very, very fast. Like that is like sports photography level, but it does 30 frames per second with a slight crop and it has a raw buffer that is absolutely insane. It has a raw buffer of 114 JPEGs or 34 or 54 photos in full uncompressed raw, depending on exactly what frame rate you're shooting in. But that's insane. This camera on the surface looks pretty standard, but it's actually like a secret fast, like sports photography camera just hidden in there for just about 13 bucks. Like if I told you, you could do this kind of fast, photo shooting with a Canon 90D, you would lose your mind. Be like, whoa, that's really fast because Canon 90D only does 15 frames per second and has like a raw buffer of, I think 20 photos. But this does way more and costs less. So yeah, it's one of the many things about this camera that I think people just often overlook. And for any of my friends out there that do fashion, sports, wildlife photography, you totally get what I'm talking about. Having a fast frame rate for photos is great. Like having 20, 30, great, fantastic. Though usually you have to pay four to $5,000 to get a camera that can go that fast. And usually these cameras don't have a very good raw buffer. But this camera does fast photos and has an amazing raw buffer for about $1,300. This thing actually competes or outcompetes most Canon cameras that cost $3,000 to $5,000 for only about $1,300. Like this is criminally overlooked and it's an amazing camera for photos. And given how capable this camera is video wise, I think this is kind of the perfect camera in this price range at least. It does everything super well. If you shoot weddings, music festivals, fashion, just anything you want. It does 10 baits. So you're getting tons of colors. You can really push and pull your image. You can like lower the exposure, darken it a bit. And that's a lot more flexibility than the 8-bit images that you get out of the Sony camera. Plus it has F-Log built in, which is like a log profile that gives you super flat colors. And then you can grade it later on. F-Log combined with 10-bit colors, 4K at 60, 200 megabits per second rate. Like I would happily shoot a TV series on this, like a low budget micro doc. There's really nothing that I wouldn't do on this. Like I'd happily shoot music videos on this. I would find that this camera is very, very capable. And at this price point, like it's really, really impressive. And to kind of put this into context for you, imagine if Canon said, hey, for 1300 bucks, we're gonna give you a camera that does 4K at 60, 10 bit color, fast autofocus, it's a really good photo camera for 1300 bucks. You would lose your mind. Like for 1500 bucks, the Canon 90D doesn't even do 4K at 60. It does 8-bit color still, and it does not have the photo capabilities of this camera. This camera is like really, really impressive, and it's just one of those things, because it's Fuji, it's not a super big name. It tends to get overlooked. Also, quick side note, guys, when you go into 4K mode, there is no crop. But when you go into 4K and 60 frames per second, there is a slight 1.7 times crop, but it's easy to work around. If you need to get wider, just go to a wider lens or you just step back a little bit. Most of your footage that you're gonna be shooting at 4K at 60 is going to be in slow motion anyways, and people won't really notice if you're going to a wider lens or if you're not getting the exact depth of field. It's an easy workaround, but I wanted to let you guys know. Now that we have the technical stuff out of the way, I really wanna talk about the colors in this camera because Fuji does colors in a very special way. Here's a brief history lesson. Fuji used to make 35 millimeter like celluloid film all the way back in the 20s, 40s, 60s, and Fuji's 
been one of the dominant companies with Kodak that's made 35 millimeter film. When Fuji decided to start making digital cameras, they said we don't want to let go of our old color science because Fuji is just known for this specific color look. If you know anyone that shoot, still shoots film, they all shoot Fuji or Kodak, but it's the two main companies. But Fuji tends to be more popular. And what they did was they took the algorithm, the chemical process of that 35 millimeter film, turned it into a mathematical algorithm and put it in these cameras. So these cameras come with built-in film emulation for all the standard, most popular Fuji stock, plus a couple other things because this is like their high-end XT30 flagship camera. But it comes with all these beautiful color profiles and just you can pick any one of them and you get these amazing colors. Plus, Fuji also adds a contrast curve to all these profiles. So depending on what profile you're shooting on, your blacks might be darker, your light might be lighter, you get might, might get different types of dynamic range in them. But you just get these really distinct artsy looks and I love that about this camera. I think my favorite thing about shooting Fuji is that I always get these really interesting looks straight out of the camera and often I shoot with my Fuji camera because I've had this camera for about two years now. I always shoot with my Fuji in JPEG, not expecting to adjust anything because the camera's internal settings for color and contrast are just so spot on. And that I think is one of the most interesting things about this camera. If you want to get close to the 35 millimeter experience, this is a total must for you. But if you want to just start creating work that's art and you want to kind of just focus more on composition and character and performance from your actors and you want to kind of leave the technical stuff back, this camera is fantastic because it gives you such good color and contrast right of the camera that you can just you just have more time to focus on that stuff where normally like I find if I'm shooting with Sony's like I'm shooting with S-Log everything looks really flat and I just have to imagine that it looks good in my head or like what it'll look like in post. And then I'm, I find myself getting too caught up with like the technical stuff in Sony's or Canon's. But with this camera, I'm like, that's what it's gonna look like. That's the image that I'm working with. And then it gives me more time to tweak my lights, work with my models, and just overall just leads to a completely different experience. And really, if you're gonna pick up one of these cameras, prepare to shoot like you've never shot before. This camera just offers such a unique experience that like, if you're into photos at all, I have to, have to recommend and just take a day or two with these cameras because they're really, really special. Just a quick side note, guys. I wanted to quickly touch upon this, the noise in this camera. It has this really interesting filmic noise. There is grain in the image, but it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look like digital sensor noise. It looks closer to filmic noise, kind of like the Canon C300 Mark II, which is a $30,000 camera, by the way. But the noise in this camera is really cinematic and it's actually really pleasant and there's settings inside the camera that let you dial up or dial down the noise. So that's something that they were clearly thinking about when they made this camera. In terms of low light, I find this camera is completely clean and very usable at 6400 ISO, which is Sony territory. But when you get up to 8000, there's just a hint of grain, but it's still very cinematic. It's not Sony level low light, but this is pretty dang great and it kills anything Canon's doing right now. Next, let's talk about autofocus, because if you know me and you've been watching this channel for a while, I love talking about autofocus. I am just obsessed with autofocus. I think it is like one of the most important features in a camera. So the autofocus in this camera, photo, perfect. 10 out of 10. I literally never felt this camera gave me a single, like I can't think of a single time where it kind of hunted or didn't quite catch autofocus even in low light. It's just always, always been perfect. I was so impressed by it. I recently reviewed the Nikon D850, which is a $8,000 camera, or I think it's now 6,000, but it is amazing for photo. Like photo, I think this thing is good for fashion, street photography, wildlife photography. Focus in this camera, 10 out of 10. Focus for video, still really freaking good. I thought it'd be shitty because I recently reviewed the Fuji X-T30, which is like the little brother of this camera. And I wasn't that impressed with it, but honestly, this thing comes with a slew of options on how to make the autofocus good. The autofocus, if you track between just like objects that are inanimate, it's okay. Like I would give it like a 7.5 to an eight. Like it just depends on exactly time and where. But the face tracking and eye tracking this camera is really good. And it's a technology that overall, pretty much everybody does well now. But what I found really impressive about this camera is that I could adjust the sensitivity of the autofocus in this camera to be really fast or really slow. And generally I find, apart from the Sony's, no one can really do run and gun autofocus really well. If you want like perfect 20 out of 10 autofocus, get a Sony A6400, A6500, A6600. Those cameras 
are amazing. They have AI autofocus in them, which is like artificial intelligence autofocus, and it's perfect. But with this camera, I felt it got really, really well. I'd give it like eight or a nine, but it was just really, really good. I never really felt like it hunted. I felt like I could shoot models walking towards me, kind of walk around people in a 360 and just shoot stuff without giving too much attention to autofocus. And it was pretty fast. And I was really worried because this Fuji lens is really made for photos. It's not really made for video, but the autofocus holds up with this lens and it's just overall impressive. I don't think this autofocus would work as well if you adapted lenses to this camera, more on that later, but just the autofocus, I was blown away. I think if you're someone that wants to shoot weddings, run and gun music festivals, the autofocus in this camera will not let you down even in low light for video. And a quick thing to note for my autofocus friends, this camera has something in it called boost mode. What it does, it speeds up the autofocus and it speeds up the refresh rate on the screen. The refresh rate on the screen isn't gonna be a huge deal, but the fact that it speeds up autofocus and just makes it track faster is awesome. It does come at a cost and reduces your battery life by a quarter, 25% according to Fuji, but that boost mode is definitely worth it in tricky autofocus situations. And while we're on the topic of video and autofocus, I quickly wanted to touch base on stabilization. This camera does not have in-body stabilization, but it's not the end of the world. This lens has built-in optical image stabilization and it does a really, really good job. I was actually really impressed with it. I was shooting, I was taking a shot and I was like, whoa, this, does this have stabilization built in? And I realized it was just the lens. The Fuji lenses have surprisingly good stabilization built right into the lenses, but there is no stabilization in the body, which can be an issue if you're planning on using vintage lenses because in that case you'll have no stabilization for video. Since we're on the topic of lenses, let's talk about the price of these lenses and this is where I think I'm going to lose some of you. These lenses are expensive. This camera is about $1,300 but this lens alone, the 16-85, to is $1,500. These lenses are not cheap. They're all made of metal. Fuji does not speak cheap and plastic when it comes to lenses. They're all really well built, solid, like lenses that are gonna last you a really long time. So, you know, they're worth the money. But generally I find that's where most people get turned off from Fuji cameras because the lenses are so expensive. And when it comes to Canon, you can grab like a cheap lens for 800 bucks, 700 bucks, grab a Sigma lens here and there, and you're good to go. These lenses are expensive, but this camera is easily adaptable. Because of the X mount, you can easily throw on an EF adapter, which is about 200 bucks, and you can go to town. And I think most of you guys would have a really good time buying $800, $600 Sigma lenses and adapting them to the Fuji because I think this camera is really worth your time and money because of the color science and the really rich video that this camera does. But if you need to save a bit of cost and put Sigma lenses on it, go for it. I think Fuji makes fantastic lenses, but whatever gets you there, right? And last but not least, let's talk about design. It's something I'm super excited to talk about with this camera. So first of all, it's made of metal. It's made of adenized aluminum. It's super light, but it feels super robust. I feel like I could drop this camera a couple of dozen times and this camera will be fine. It's super well built. It has a rubber leather grip all the way around the camera. Give, just makes it feel nice when you're holding it. It goes all the way back to the thumb area. So when I'm holding the camera, I feel like my thumb has a nice grip. My finger has a nice grip. The grip isn't super wide or deep, but honestly, somehow it just fits. I think because there's plenty of room for my thumb back here. Just, it's a good camera to hold. But here's what I'm really excited about the dials on this camera. So most cameras have a dial on the front and a dial on the back, one for shutter, one for aperture. But this camera really does it differently. It has a dial on the side right here that lets you change your ISO. The one on the right lets you change your shutter speed. And that's really different. You can still use the dials forward and back here to do everything, but it's kind of cool to look down and just be like, yeah, my shutter speed's at 125 now and my ISO, oh, let me just dial it down in or up. It's kind of fun and I find even though like using these dials is more efficient and quicker, I constantly find myself going back to these dials. And if you are worried about actually bumping one of these dials, they actually come with locks. So if you push this button down, it'll unlock and then you push it down again, it'll lock. So if you're worried about anything like that, you're good to go. Although I'm pretty sure these can actually get turned too, but Fuji gives you that option. And then below every dial is a little like sub dial, I guess. On this side, you can change your uh, shooting mode. You can go between video, continuous high, continuous low, single, all that good stuff. And on the right side, it gives you different autofocusing uh, parameters. If you wanna be single shot, wide area, all that stuff. And just what I like about this setup is the fact that usually to change 
what my metering or my autofocus is at, I have to go into a menu and change it. But here I can just look, see what it's at and just change it. It's very quick. Generally, even with like an ADD, which is really well built ergonomically, you have to look down at the, at the screen, see what the LCD screen says, hit a button, change a few things, and it's like a few seconds. But here I'm just like, it's a single, let me change it to continuous, done. It's that much simple. And I think just that whole tactile feel of changing these dials, it's very different than most cameras. Most cameras, I'm not saying they're bad, I'm not saying this camera's better, it's just a very different feel. And personally, I think I enjoy the tactile feel of using my camera. Again, this camera's made to kind of remind you of old school film photography. If you're someone that likes the tactile feel of old school film photography, looking at how many shots you have left, dialing in your shutter speed and all that, this camera's really for you because photography is more than just taking a pretty photo. It's like the craft of it. And the way this camera's designed is ergonomically awesome. It's fun to use, it's got that tactile feel, but you really get into the craft of photography and that's something I really, really appreciate about this camera. And for the rest of the camera, it's really well laid out. The buttons are exactly where I would want them to be. All these buttons are programmable, but you kind of just like hit the side button, get into different menus, all that good stuff, change your focus, change your drive mode, change your zoning. It's really easy. It has, and this is something that surprised me because even the A6500 doesn't do it. It has a mic input and a headphone jack right on the same side. That makes it really easy if you want to shoot interviews, wedding, do any kind of like audio related work, it's all there. Like the A6500, it has an external mic jack, but no, nothing for listening, which I really appreciate because usually most cameras of this size just do one. So I appreciate that I've got both one for in and out. It's got an HDMI for external recorders, which this camera would be great for. And it's got a USB port if you don't want to take your SD cards out. It's got dual SD card slots that are both UHS-2. It's like the top speeds that you can get. You have two of them, so you never really have to worry about raw buffer as we talked about earlier, but you never really have to worry about running out of space because you put a 128 in one side, a 128 in the other side, that's almost quarter terabyte, you're good to go. But there is one thing about this camera design-wise that I don't like. So this flip screen is kind of stiff and awkward to open. It just, I've never really felt it had the same smoothness at a Sony screen. And Sony screens, I really like what they have on the back. It doesn't do flip up or anything. It just kind of goes to this with like the A6000, uh, which really, you know, whatever, fine. I don't, it's not like a make or break for me. Here's the part that just straight off just annoyed me. It just peeved me. I can't really swear on YouTube, but the flip screen, this is Fuji's version of a flip screen. It just kind of goes to the side, which is not even the side you want a flip screen to go out to. You want a flip screen to go out to this side so you can hold the camera and vlog with it. I genuinely don't know what the point of this is. So I can point the camera this way and look at it. It makes no sense. The back of this flip screen, this design is stupid. Honestly, they could have saved a couple bucks by just making it this. Fuji, if you're listening, X-T4 or X-T3.2, Give us a flip screen, it, we need one. Since we're talking about cons with this camera, we might as well talk about the biggest, and to be honest, I think it's the only con about this camera, is the battery life. The battery life, I find, generally doesn't last more than an hour and a half or two, and I always shoot on boost mode, so probably not getting ideal battery performance, but I want that fast autofocus. But yeah, the battery life just isn't that great. It's kind of crappy, like, so. it's not as bad as Sony cameras, but it's kind of crappy like Sony cameras. Each battery is about 30 bucks, and I find that if I have about five for the day, I usually get through it, and I can charge batteries when I'm not shooting with them, but it's not ideal. There is a battery grip that you can buy that will make it last like a day and a half, but it's a $500 battery grip. And to be honest, that's my Chipotle budget for the month, so no. If you like Chipotle, leave a like. But yeah, the battery situation with this camera isn't ideal, but it's such a good camera that I think it's easy to overlook the battery and just focus on the things about this camera that really do matter because if there's a will, there's a way. If you really want to work with this camera, you'll figure a way around the battery stuff. So at the end of the day, who's this camera really for? I would really say this camera's for hardcore enthusiasts and professionals. I think if you're a professional, fashion photographer, street photographer, like you do dance and stuff, like this camera will be great. You'll get really fast action shots, great color science, everything's tack sharp, great noise performance. This camera's fantastic. But if you're someone that does studio work, like you do like product shots and high-end commercial work, 
I don't think the sensor has the megapixels to support all the retouching you do. In fashion, like even if someone looks flawless, you always have to make the skin look smoother. You always have to like liquefy and fix little things. I just don't think this camera has the megapixel count to support that kind of work. But if you're a hardcore enthusiast like me, and you care about the craft of photography and cinematography, you care about the colors, and like just getting these amazing, beautiful shots, get this camera, because it's small, light, fast, great video, great photo. You'll really, really enjoy it. If you're someone that just is really enthusiastic about your hobby, definitely this is a worthwhile investment. It's only $1,400 for the body. With the lens, it's about, uh, I think I paid 2,000 ish for my lens and my camera when I bought it. It's a pretty good deal. The one person that I absolutely do not recommend buy this camera is if you're just like a mom and dad, you don't really care about the art of photography and cinematography. You're like, I just want something cheap to like shoot my kids at on their birthday, their dance recital and stuff. Wouldn't recommend it. You could easily get something like the Canon M50, which is about 600 bucks. Any of the lower end Nikons, maybe even like a Canon T7i. You'd be totally fine with it because you won't notice all the work that Fuji has put into them. If you care about the colors, because my neighbor Jen has two kids and she has an X-T20. She's like, I don't want an Nikon or a Canon because I love the colors out of this camera. I'd recommend something like the Fuji X-T20, X-T30, or the X100F. But those cameras are much cheaper. They're way below $1,000 and you'll still get the same Fuji color sign. So I recommend looking to that. The Fuji X-T3 is really a flagship camera made for enthusiasts and professionals. And ultimately, I kind of think this is the perfect APS-C size camera in this price range. For about $1,300, you're getting 10-bit video, 4K at 60, although with a slight crop, but still 4K at 10-bit up to 30, no crop. And you're getting amazing Fuji colors. I would be really hard-pressed to find another camera that's this compelling in features, color science, specs, and data rates than the Fuji. If you guys have other suggestions, let me know down below. I'm always looking for new cameras, but when it comes to this camera, I don't think I would switch to another camera. If I wanted to get 4K and 60, I'd have to go to a 1DX Mark II, a Nikon D850 or a GH5, but those cameras are either way more money or something like the GH5, I feel does not have appropriate color science. I really don't like the color science out of those cameras. And the sensor is much smaller and then I have to get a speed booster and it just increases the cost of the camera. Yeah, just, this is the camera for me. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out the video. If you are vibing with the content, be sure to leave a like, and there's a link down below for the best deal on the Fuji X-T3, so be sure to check that out. And if you have any questions whatsoever about this camera or anything else on the channel, hit me up in the comments down below, and I'll make sure to get back to every single one of you. Until next time, guys.